You're listening to the Goldnomics Podcast with new episodes every month on iTunes, YouTube and SoundCloud. Subscribe to stay informed. Hello and welcome to the Goldnomics Podcast. This is episode 16 of the Goldnomics Podcast, where we look at global developments through the lens of precious metals. And I'm joined again this month by Stephen Flood, CEO of uh, Goldcore, and Marco Byrne, uh, research consultant for Goldcore. Welcome, gents. Hey, Dave. Dave. Hi, everybody. Now, our topic this year the title or not this year this 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 episode the title of this podcast is what we're doing to prepare for the great reset and before we dive into that i just want to remind everybody to subscribe to this podcast you can subscribe on itunes on youtube on soundcloud or indeed wherever it is that you digest and consume your podcasts um, and you can also sign up for our precious metals update at goldcore.com. Now, the great reset and what we're doing to prepare. Gents, I want to know what you guys are doing to prepare for the great reset. But before I do that, uh, I'd like to fully understand and our audience would also like to fully understand what is meant by the great reset. Um, it's a term that we've uh, heard in the media uh, and online for a while, but need to fully understand exactly. Maybe, Mark, maybe I'll come to you first. The Great Reset, what do you mean by the Great Reset? Well, yeah, it's a term that's been popularized uh, and gone into the mainstream in recent months uh, from the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab, who is the, the founder of the World Economic Forum, which is basically a sort of a somewhat elitist think tank uh, born out of Davos and the Davos elites, the, uh, the billionaire class uh, of the world who have been meeting up in Davos uh, uh, for, for many, many years now. And this, is the, this is the... the, the, the symposium you might call it or whatever that you, you see each year coming from switzerland exactly, and they're all exactly. standing around you'll see it on cnbc and sky news and cnn and they're exactly. all standing around in the snow uh interviewing all these various different um people from from corporations from banks from the world economic forum itself exactly uh, yeah 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 Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's basically a, a giant annual conference of no, the, 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 wealthy, the wealthiest uh, people in society and, and particularly the, uh, the founders of the giant corporations and the owners of giant corporations, uh, the bank executives and indeed the politicians, whether it be Christine Lagarde or, you know, the, the central bankers who, who, as we've long talked about, uh, ultimately uh, run the world, run the monetary world, as you know, and have great influence over all our lives in terms of the, the, the economic world and the political worlds we live in. So it's come out of that sort of milieu, shall we say, and, and basically uh, Klaus Schwab himself has said that they're using uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, so-called pandemic, depending on your view, and the lockdowns in order to uh, execute this uh, great reset plan because it, they see it as an opportunity, you know, because out of crisis, you can, uh, it's easier to, to get certain things done, shall we say, you know. So, and, and basically what they're talking about is, uh, so stakeholder capitalism which sounds wonderful uh, uh, in itself because we're all believers in capitalism and we're all believers in stakeholders but uh, they're talking about uh, yeah so what they call the fourth industrial revolution which is very much a, a sort of a tech technocratic uh, a, a dream of uh, technocratic governance and the use of technology in our lives day to day whether we want it or not uh, from everything from artificial intelligence to drones to uh, Internet of Things. So all, all these things uh, are, are basically, they're saying that this is going to be the, 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 new, uh, the new economy that we're going to create. We're going to build back better is, is the term that's used, you know. And, and, and it, it sounds wonderful. And, and, and I think some of the people are genuine good people and, and, and there's really good ideas there. And if, if it's done in the right way that genuinely has the interest of citizens <clears throat> and the stakeholders, all the stakeholders, including individuals, families and businesses, then it could be wonderful. But but there are concerns that it, it may be uh, sort of more of the same. Uh, you know, we have, as we spoke, talked in this podcast many times over the years, there's a degree of corporatocracy in the world whereby basically, you know, giant corporations are very much in control uh, in the world and most governments and politicians are 
but have a, more of a sort of a managerial role, shall we say? Mm. So, so yeah. So that's 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 my view uh, 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 anyway. But I think Stephen has a has a he has a, an interesting view because he's been going on the World Economic Forum and doing a bit of research there sure. in terms of how, how they uh, frame it. So f fair to fair to say that uh, the kind of the purpose of this World Economic Forum is to a degree to proactively manage developments within economies uh, and society and the, the 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 global financial system as well, rather than what we've had in um, years gone by, because it has been disjointed. Before we've had this interconnectedness and this globalization, it's been the developments have been uh, very disjointed and fairly much organic within those. Uh, whether it's countries or 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 uh, and and now the World Economic Economic Forum has this view or this goal to more proactively manage that. Would you would you agree with that, Steve? Yeah, I mean, like it's it's the wheels are coming off the bus. You know, I mean, uh, the world has been organised around the dollar for so long now, and globalisation and. Uh, um, and uh, kind of inter an interconnected uh, market-based economy, and it's under threat, and it's under threat from a number of different uh, places. Um, they've identified this, and they're stating that their goal is to kind of hit the reset button to reassess what our priorities are as a as a race, as a as a, as a you know for the planet, um, and to look at what we did before and if it see if it's fit for purpose going forward. I don't think anybody could possibly have an issue with that i mean that that does make sense that 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 things are changing um they're changing environmentally um depending on where you are there's the our environment is is changing it's it's proven to be um you're looking at your 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 it's changing from a debt perspective the amount of debt in the world we're just living off debt and off tomorrow basically to pay for today so that that shows a massive imbalance uh, our population is growing at an extraordinary rate um seven billion today ten billion in you know, maybe 30 or 40 years from now. And uh, and the incentives for work and uh, for economy is changing as well because our markets have ceased to work. Let's, let's, let's face facts. The market economy is no longer working, especially for our financial instruments, for debt. for um, and, and so they've identified this. What, what, uh, what, now, just to... Yeah. What can you point to as just a demonstration for our audience when you say yeah. that markets have, stop, have stopped working? I mean, just give me kind of like one or two kind of very, very high level... Uh, examples so just to kind of back that up well, i i think i think uh, anybody who who watches the markets will look at the uh, the hand of official sector in the markets to maintain stability so they see it now as their as their remit uh, to not only you know you know protect us against inflation and and to a lesser extent uh, you know get get us to full employment but they also want stability in our financial markets so that that uh, that that prices of things don't vary too much like currencies they were always active in and protecting certain currencies from the market gyrations but now they're active in the equity markets and they're active in the bond markets and um uh, there's the, there was an interesting story there recently where uh, it was stated that next year it is expected that the entire issuance of european government bonds so the, the, the whole euro area will be consumed by the central bank of europe um the ecb and they're going to consume every single bond issued by governments uh, and do so at a very very high price giving the borrowing costs of governments in maintaining very low which under ordinary circumstances in a, in a market-based economy would never happen and they're doing so in order to stabilize but what they're also doing is they're undermining the market economy which you know the the price for uh price ex uh, exploration and, and price um, uh, price performance is that you have uh, volatility as as news flow is is you know is is uh, is absorbed into the market and people you know use their own money to take a take a punt on things. So they're getting involved. They're getting in front of the mar of the market who were in the market before normal punters, and they are uh, they're defining it. So all of these things point to a crisis, multiple crises, and the World Economic Forum and the people behind it, uh, their stated goal, and I'm sure there are a lot of people who would disagree with this and maybe maybe they would be correct is to have a conversation to figure out what will be the next step forward how do we how do we prioritize what's important and as, as you know dave you know you've been with goldcore for so long and and and, and been a fantastic uh, board member i always recall and i quote you often uh you always uh, you always tell us like before we start this contentious meeting or whatever it's going to be or this big decision let's figure out uh you know how do we make decisions mm -hmm. um and 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 it's important it's a very important process so I think they're actually having that kind of conversation. They're they're talking about how do we look? We have a problem. 
let's figure out how we make a decision and let's figure out what sort of model is going to come out after that. Now, there, I say there will be lots of people who say, and they could be right, that the outcome is predetermined, that this is about a power grab, this is about um, you know, you know, reducing people's rights, uh, enslaving people, and 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 really just you know pre preserving the the elite status of of the few. Um, I I would you know. I would obviously hope not, but uh, I do think that the premise is correct. We do need to have a conversation around these things. What happens if this uh, conversation, this World Economic Forum, this concept of discussing these things and trying to proactively manage them, what happens if that doesn't take place? In terms of that particular forum? Not necessarily that particular forum, but just the whole exercise. If we decide, okay, we're not going to proactively manage um, we're not going to proactively manage. We're just going to allow things to continue on as they are. What's the natural conclusion then? Yeah, um, I'll go in there real quick, Mark. I, I think I think sometimes if you have a problem that's facing you in business or in life or anything, if you can if you can take preemptive action, you can define the outcome or have more say in the outcomes that are that are going to be explored. Mm. Um, so you either make the decisions or you have the decisions made for you. Okay. Um, without coordination, that's going to be a survival of the fittest. It's going to be carnage up until that point. One champion is going to come out on top and they're going to define exactly what, what, what the rules by which everyone else plays by. So I, I would think, you know, in, a, in what was a multipolar to a unipolar and now it's becoming a multipolar world again. You know, there are other players, at, you know, on the block and they would they would decide uh, what the rules would be. Just, just on that, I, I tend to agree with both, and I, I know where you're coming from with the question, Dave. Uh, but I suppose uh, the issue is it's how uh, it's the agenda for the meeting, uh, if you will, and identifying what the problems are. And sometimes, mm -hmm. if you haven't correctly identified exactly what the problems are, you may be tackling the wrong issue, shall we say? And I, I'll just give you one example of this, and there's a few of them, but one of them, and Stephen has correctly uh, talked about the climate crisis, crisis that we face, and there's no doubt about it, we face a massive climate crisis, and we have done for years, and nothing's been done about it. And these same people have been talking the talk about the environment for 20, 30 years, and they've done absolutely nothing. They've actually made it much, much worse, the corporations in particular, who are at the front of this World Economic Forum, you know. So, and all they tend to do is focus on climate change and uh, the carbon dioxide emissions. And then it's all about taxing individuals and taxing families and small businesses in particular, because the corporations can get away with these things in, in, in many ways. So the climate is a much, much bigger thing. The, 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 the big, biggest risk to our climate is, uh, sorry, not to the climate, the, big, the environment, the biggest risk to our environment is what we're doing to the soil of the planet, which has been destroyed. And that destroys our food, our food supply and then that destroys our health uh, and our immune systems and our ability to fight diseases and and and, and, and viruses uh, so does this and then what we're doing to the sea as well whether it be uh, fukushima uh, overfishing the plastic in the sea and we're seeing uh, you know uh, i hate to use the word extinction because these people are crazies who are uh, anti-democracy and, and, and there's a lot of dangerous extreme people out there but there are real risks to, to, to our planet and to, to our environment. And, and I, my concern is that all the focus is on carbon dioxide emissions and taxing that. And, and, and meanwhile, you know, big corporations, I won't name any names, but big corporations that might be involved, say, in genetically modified foods, for example, uh, people of the world and nation states have made decisions in recent years saying we don't want a genetically modified food, uh, as an mm -hmm. example. And now a lot of these uh, things that we have actually decided as individuals, families, uh, communities and nations we've decided we don't want, they may be foisted upon us by the back door. So that's that's the concern. So, you know, this could be, it's like anything, you know, if the intention is right and if the right people are in there and they genuinely have the interest at, at heart of individuals and families and, and businesses and, and the, the nation states rather than the interests of certain giant corporations then uh, this is a wonderful project it sounds wonderful except i have, do have concerns about even the, the, they talk about you know the need for uh, you know more and more control more and more surveillance state using technology to to monitor our movements so there's a lot there's quite an authoritarian underbelly to this as well that is quite concerning to many people mm. so yeah, yeah. So, it, but it's, it's it's fascinating, and and I think, but ultimately, we we shouldn't give up all our power. There is a lot of doom and gloom, and people saying, you know, we're going to end up in this 
you know, communists, fascists, uh, you know, brutal totalitarian 1984 state. And, and I don't think things are that bad at all. You know, they could go there if we, if we all give up our power and, and, and we all sort of, uh, you know, assume worst case scenarios, then that's where we will end up. But if we all speak out and say, listen, this is what we want. What we want as individuals, as families, as businesses, this is our vision for the future. Then, you know, and we can hopefully we can impact this, this great reset and, and make it a more benign, uh, democratic, uh, liberal, uh, liberal uh, in terms of the, the 19th century liberal view of, you know, free markets, free market capitalism, liberal democracy. The, the values that, that we would all share, you know. So what we're talking about here is we're talking about proactively trying to manage the direction that we're going in as society, as economies, as a as a, as a planet, uh, being controlled um, by this collection of of individuals who set the agenda. Uh, and if you set the if you set the agenda, you ultimately influence have much greater influence or are the influencing factor on the on the on the outcomes. Um, so we're saying, who is it that's actually setting the agenda in this situation, and are uh, and and are the best interests of um, of the people and the population being served by this? Given that that's the situation, what is the likely just to kind of talk about what is the likely direction that this is going to take, and what impact is that likely to have on our audience, our our, our listeners? So at this moment in time, given what we do know. What's the biggest implication? Um, what's the biggest change that we're going to be looking at that's going to directly influence us? Uh, you know, I, I, it's it's really interesting. The COVID crisis has um, has raised so many questions that we we're all kind of trying to get our head around. Um, one of them is kind of it's kind of a second or third level question. It's it's uh, the idea of people working remotely. And what we found is is that large companies situated in single cities with diverse work workforce um, during COVID went to different countries, back to their home countries. And they, they went back to their villages and their towns and they worked from there just as productively as they would if they were working in London or Dublin or New York. And it's created a problem with the, for the taxation of these people and those companies and those locations. And been, the companies are telling these people to come back to the cities and you are to work in the city where you where your office was, but don't come to the office, but work in your apartment and do your work from there. And uh, the person is saying, like, well, why? I'm from Portugal. I want to live beside the golf course and I can work just quickly from my um, half priced apartment. And, uh, and, and the system doesn't allow, that for, allow for that, which is ridiculous. Mm. It should allow for that. So what we're seeing is, is a challenge, I believe, towards the old system of borders, of government, of regional governments, regional regulators, and regional currencies. And the whole regional aspect to our economic construction is up for grabs, basically. And I think what you're going to see is something coming from this or a movement towards more of a, and I know this is going to freak people out, more of a global government, or, or at least a global government on, a, on for certain things, such as environmental coordination, such as uh, maybe workforce or labor movement or something like that. Um, you know, national boundaries will exist, and but bar tra trade barriers and tariffs will be, come under pressure. So you might see a, a, a kind of more fuzzy European Union Union and a fuzzier United States of America, where there's an awful lot more uh, uh, transient uh, movement of goods and services and people uh, in order to coordinate uh, environmental response and health response and, and of things of that nature. I think that's probably not a bad thing. I think an awful lot of benefit could come from that, uh, but it requires enormous amounts of trust, and uh, which we don't have these days in much in 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 any major way. So um, I think there's a huge challenges, but I think uh, these problems that we mentioned before, you know, environment, population, the uh, incentives that are there are all they're all partially as a result of these hard boundaries that we have around our our countries and our economic areas. Yeah, very good. Um, so the, the question again, Dave, was uh, how will what, it impact us? To, yeah, uh, what are the likely impact? what are the likely changes that we are going to see as a result of this reset? Now, we, we like we've discussed for the, the the beginning of this what we mean by a reset, but yeah, what well, yeah, what change what changes am I going to see? I think Personally. the biggest change, uh, the biggest change, I'd, I'd like to just widen the reset a small bit because we have looked at the reset. The original uh, sort of uh, talk of a reset was back uh, uh, around the financial crisis, 2008, 9, 10. We all realized the scale of that financial crisis was going to lead to, you know, a, a massive recession and 
a fundamentally different world, or we thought it would, and it hasn't really, things haven't changed a whole lot, except for what Stephen alluded to before, the, the end of free market capitalism. We, we don't have markets anymore. We just have interventions by central banks and, and, and the, the Q quantitative easing, which is now QE to infinity, which we said it would be when it was QE1, QE2, QE3. We said this will end up being QE2 to infinity until the currencies collapse and we go to some form of you know, potentially a global currency backed by gold, uh, or if things go multipolar again, as Stephen was saying, then, you, you know, you have the Chinese yuan backed by gold and you have the maybe a Western uh, 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 a common currency backed by gold or a US currency backed by gold and a, a euro or whatever it is. So, but the, going back then, it's interesting. I, I went back in and, and looked at uh, the market updates that we're doing back then and the first mention of uh, the uh, currency reset, but actually the, the, the global reset was by Mark Faber. Uh, and Mark mm -hmm. Faber is the author of the Gloom Boom Doom Report. And he was writing about this reset back in 2010. Uh, and we had him on our podcast obviously over the years and he, you know he's a very astute investor and, and, and highly respected uh, but he, his definition of it was the sort of the older definition uh, which was that the currencies would be reset versus gold because we were going to see uh, currencies massively devalued, devalued uh, both versus each other but more particularly versus hard the hard assets and the monetary assets of gold and silver so in that scenario you would see you know the dollar the euro the pound all these fiat currencies because of the amount of uh, currency creation that's happening uh, on a scale never seen before in, in the history of the world that you would see all these currencies come down and then you would see a reset uh, of the price of these currencies versus gold at say ten thousand dollars euros pounds per ounce and that was the traditional as uh, that was the first uh, talk of the uh, which, great... which would which would mean that it would um, limit the ability for countries to continue to create currency uh, it would, yeah, and it would be a sort of a new Bretton Woods, if you will, um, mm -hmm. and it should enforce. Just ex some... explain now, particularly with your 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 economic history background, for those that uh, don't don't uh, understand or the the Bretton Woods Agreement. Uh, can you so, just give us a, a ten second yeah. on that? Yeah, but Bretton was basically end of World War II, 1945. Uh, obviously, Germany lost the war. Uh, there was massive economic destruction tr 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 throughout the world. You know, we had a massive recession, uh, a borderline depression. So the great powers, uh, America, uh, uh, the UK, Russia, uh, the French, Ger Germans. Uh, the Germans were obviously less powerful because they're the defeated nation, but uh, they had a, a lesser seat at the table, shall we say. But they basically create this architecture for the, the monetary system and indeed the economic system because, you know, uh, they're, they're obviously intimately linked and, and you don't have any economy without uh, any the money. So the money is quite important in, in that whole grand scheme of things. So they basically uh, uh, positioned the dollar as the new reserve currency of the world backed by gold at a national level. So the individual citizens were not using gold coins anymore, but the dollar itself uh, was the reserve currency of the world and it was used in international trade and the buying of, particularly of commodities and coal and steel and and, and, and these uh, and agricultural commodities, but and also prior, of, of goods and services. Prior to and that, that then, the reserve it. currency would have been well, it was the, the British pound uh, during the British Empire, and they had the, the, their gold standard, and that became the, the reserve currency of the world. So, so we only have to go back 70, 80 years um, when we actually saw a re we saw a currency reset happening before. Exactly, okay. exactly. So, so this slightly... is not this is not some sort of conspiracy theory idea that this <laughs> might happen. This happens. And even that was not the first time in history that it happened. It has happened a number of times in history as reserve currency of the world has changed uh, uh, depending upon the, the, the flow of power. Uh, absolutely. So we've, it happened we've seen sure. a reset and we're, we're yeah. talking about the potential for the same thing to happen. So this is not mm. just kind of, as I say, conspiracy well, exactly, um, exactly. It, it happened even again. Yeah. It happened in 1971. There's another form of, of uh, currency reset when when Nixon went off the the, the gold standards and uh, uh, completely. And and today we have uh, unbacked fiat currencies, you know, which creates massive risk. And that's why these currencies are going to be massively devalued. So some people, so so Mark Faber was the first person to talk about this great reset. And then Jim Rickards, uh, he wrote his book Currency Wars in 2011, and and he sort of I uh, suppose took ownership of of that whole uh, currency reset. Uh, 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 idea or notion, you know. So, and some people do have concerns, particularly in the gold space, that is this great reset uh, almost a distraction away from 
you know, uh, many of us, and we've talked about this in this podcast, it looks like we're on the verge of a massive global recession, you know, given the scale of the economic destruction from, from the virus, but more particularly I think from the lockdowns, but that's a conversation for a different day. But, but so it looks like we're on the verge of massive global recession and potentially depression. Uh, and the Great Reset, some have concerns that it sort of distracts away from the currency reset because uh, they don't want the citizens being aware of this because then potentially they'll take money out of banks, they'll take money out of uh, stock markets and bonds and out of their pensions and, and they'll put it into, you know, they'll put it into gold and silver, they'll put it under the mattress, they'll, 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 be, they'll be very nervous if they become aware of this current this currency reset. So, you know, the, 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 but the bottom line is I think that should be as much a focus uh, as the Great Reset because there's, there's more things you can do in terms of protecting yourself against that you know and uh and uh so i do think uh, so, uh yeah I, there, there should I, be a bigger I, bigger focus on that yeah right kind of go if, if i can ask you guys for a uh, for instance right so let's assume that this um currency reset or this great reset happens tomorrow right for instance what impact does it have on me if i don't do anything how's how how are my finances how's my life going to change potentially i mean what am i um what am I protecting or preparing myself against if I take certain actions? What happens if I what happens if I take no action? How am I negatively affected? Do you want me to answer that, or do you want to go ahead, Steve? Well, it's a tough one. Um, you know, if you don't take any action, you're going to be told what to do. You're going to be the receiving end of whatever happens. Um, I mean, again, it's it's a hard one because this is just the beginning of a conversation. We're going to yeah. be talking about this more and more over the next five, ten years. Um, it depends on how on how these things develop over time. And so, from and, a personal from a personal uh, wealth point of view, let's, yeah. let's say, what might happen if I don't take action? I, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. You know, mm. personally and. Uh, 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 the first thing and with any any unknown is to educate yourself and to be vigilant um so you need to keep an eye on this one you need to keep an eye on what's happening the conversations and uh who's involved and what their agendas might be and uh, and so read read well and uh and and keep good company um and be vigilant i think obviously and it goes to what we are about you know in terms of the risk you know owning some precious metals in your portfolio just makes an awful lot of sense it's a form of money it can't be debased it can't be printed and you and you we've spoken about that many many times so you should definitely own precious metals in the right way and again if i if i don't what's the risk if you don't then you're going to be on you're going to be in currency the currency could it's its value could be wiped out or severely diminished um, or have certain restrictions applied to it, which would again severely restrict its its value and its its utility to you. Okay. So you know you can only extract a certain amount of money per day. You can't do big things unless you get a special stamping and uh, you know from the VAT office or whatever it is, and and or from the the, the your tax office. So your 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 form of currency is going to be, is going to inform your option the options that you have and so it makes sense that you have a form of currency that is kind of somewhat independent and is you know as we say before personal sovereignty uh, that's what gold gives you um the other thing i think people in businesses in particular need to watch out is the, is the nature of their of their uh, their debtors you know who who they who owes the money you know and what the terms of that are what the contracts they have are you know, uh, are they long term? Are they short term? Are there what? What is the nature of, nature of a force majeure break or breach in, in terms? Um, and so, just keep an eye on that in terms of what you know. What happens if the currency comes becomes compromised in some way? Um, does that is is that in the interest of, of the person who owes you money or in the interest of the person who has it? At the moment, it's a, a debt will sit on your balance sheet as an asset uh, at face value. And if it suddenly you know you go through a process and and the currencies are changed or a new currencies come in and it's a global currency. What happens to that old currency that that debt is paid in? And maybe your your what, the the money that you received in order to pay off your liabilities might be different or out of, out of match, not matched up. So you might have uh, risks, new risks uh, on your balance sheet that you weren't aware of before. So you need to kind of m- you know actively manage those sort of things and understand where your where your risks are spread. Uh, and then the the last one. And it relates to the first one is get active. You know, it's it's you know to to be involved in your in the debate where possible through your industry associations in terms of business, through your local political contacts in your in your community, and, and just be you know be a, be a, a a proponent for you know sens- sensible policy. And uh, and and it does come. It does you know these things. It's important that that every little person, every one person, you know, all of us, you know, unite and you know par- participate in the debate. Um, because if you're not there, you know, you're you're one 
you're not adding your voice and and that's a that's that's a that's a, a terrible thing and uh you you have a duty to do so so i think you need to be uh, vocal um uh, is important mark yeah very good great great tips and pointers there steve um so I think the, the, so the biggest risk is the inflation risk, because in that scenario, a lot of people don't realize, they think, oh, well, so what? Gold's gone to $10,000 euros per ounce. But in effect, that means your currency has been massively devalued. Uh, and it's been devalued, not necessarily just against gold or silver per se, but it, it would most likely would be devalued versus uh, the cost of raw materials, of food, of water. So therefore, people's standard of living, uh, the cost of living most likely would go up very sharply. You would see very strong inflation, stagflation, or in a worst case scenario, potentially hyperinflation. And so that's why they would peg uh, gold to the currencies because they're trying to prevent the loss of faith in the currency uh, and maintain faith in the fiat currencies backed by, with a renewed backing of gold. So the inflation risk is, is one risk uh, and, and, and owning gold and silver, you can you know protect your purchasing power. You know, that's what they're about. Uh, I think Stephen sort of alluded to it, the access to savings as well. You know, you could in these, worst case scenarios there could be uh, bank holidays banks could be shut for a period of time whereby they, they get reorganized they get uh, forced mergers a lot of the banks around the world are still very very vulnerable and we're not even talking about that and it's amazing the great reset there's no talk about whatsoever you know <laughs> um and, and obviously these banks would most likely be bailed out again uh, when they shouldn't be many of these banks should go to the wall and we should go to sort of some form of uh, one or two pillar banks for a period of time and then and, and then foster co competition with credit unions and post offices and have an, uh, an ecosystem for our savings, you know. But you, what you could see is bank holidays a period of time. The cash out of the ATMs could be limited to 50 euro a day. You might only be allowed to do a wire transfer of a thousand or three thousand or five thousand euros per day. And we've actually seen forms of this obviously in recent years, uh, both in Ireland and in, in other countries around the world. You Greece. Know, mm. in, in Greece and uh, yeah, and, and even in the US, there's, there's been forms with certain banks over there. You know, there's been uh, restrictions on how much you can wire out on a daily basis and, and, and the amount that you can wire in each transaction or on a daily basis have been reduced uh, frequently. Uh, the other risk is something that we've talked about for years, which is the, the bail in risk uh, that the actual deposits are potentially, they become part part of the, uh, the the assets of the bank in order to bail out the bank. So the depositors come into play rather than just the bondholders uh, and your cash could be forcibly converted into shares in the bank. You, in effect, would take a haircut. And uh, yeah, we, people say, oh, but should we have guarantees of 100,000 uh, euros? So that means everybody's safe over 100,000. But as we've seen in the UK, the guarantee came down from 250,000 pounds to 80,000 pounds. So what would happen is uh, you would see emergency legislation over the weekend. Uh, uh, and you would see that the deposit guarantee would be reduced down to say 50,000 or 60,000 or whatever it is. It's just a round arbitrary figure. And then the last risk I think is, is people don't think about this. It's funny, uh, the, the investment risk is, risk is very significant in terms of, you know, people have balanced portfolios. They think they're balanced portfolios and they have, you know, 56% in equities and 40%, 50% in bonds. Um, and and and, they, and their pensions are, are are they think a lot of people think oh I'm safe I have my pension all the rest but your pension is denominated in dollars or in euros or in pounds and if the currency is devalued massively uh, uh, so say as an example you you have a very safe or you consider a safe portfolio of U.S. Treasuries and uh, and German uh, 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 Deutsche Deutsche Mark uh, bonds uh, so so you're 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 what's called considered blue chip and, and the safest type of bonds in the world let's say Swiss bonds German bonds Bonds and, and American bonds, 10 years, say. So you're not going out 30 years. But those currencies, if those currencies are massively devalued uh, to the tune of 70 or 80%, and we go from $2,000 per ounce to $10,000 per ounce, then the value of those bonds that they're denominated has gone down very sharply as well, you know. So your, your pension would actually suffer very significantly. And then equities as well are done denominated in currencies. So all, all the assets that we own are pensions that are denominated in these currencies. And if the, the, the currencies are massively devalued, it's going to impact people's pensions as well. So so yeah, they're 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 the 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 the, the re and I think there's a real risk that we're not talking about, you know, because all the tension, understandably, has been on the COVID and the lockdowns, and now a lot of attention is going to the Great Reset and all these lovely buzzwords of equality and sustainability and. But just and, to, now that you uh, just as you bring it back to that, the idea of equality and and sustainability. Um, I mean, you're talking there that if we see a, a great reset, that some of the risks are that we're going to have a massive, that there could be massive inflation, uh, massive increase in the cost of living. 
are these very much unintended consequences or intended consequences of the of the Great Reset? Because I'm trying to figure out how that sits with the idea that the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset is the idea of trying to proactively manage uh, economies and society. Because when I see that at the beginning of our conversation, and then I'm juxtaposing it with the idea that you're talking about here, well, actually what's going to happen is we're going to have massive inflation and increasing cost of living. It doesn't seem like that. Is, that's a deliberate outcome or direction that, that the, the World Economic Forum or the, or the Great Reset would want to be going because it seems negative. Or are we saying that for a certain section of the population, those with investment assets and those with a certain degree of wealth, that's how it's going to be impacted. But it's possibly a leveling of financial moats for everybody. Can you talk to that for 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 a moment, just so I can kind of get that? Well, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one because uh, it, they seem to be quite divorced, you know, and and it's they're sort of so they're talking about economics uh, and the, the wonders of using technology to create a more uh, sustainable and more uh, more uh, equal uh, economy and world but meanwhile they completely ignore the elephant in the room which is you know the central banks you know electronically creating trillions and trillions and trillions of, of dollars and euros and pounds as we speak you know uh, so it's it's the, the dots aren't being joined there you know and, and therefore i would like why don't journalists ask a few questions about this, you know? And uh, uh, I, I think it's been positioned as, you know, it's that phrase, build back better. And it's almost like they think that if we sort of have a sort of a, this massive sort of uh, state corporate, uh, uh, these giant monopolies uh, work with the state to build infrastructure, then this will uh, re-engender economic growth and this will get us out of the recession, the depression. And, and there is a, you know, the, there is a rationale for that. And it does make sense because big infrastructural projects tend to create employment uh, uh, but at the same time you know you can you can build bridges to nowhere and and there can be a lot of abuse and there can be wastage and we've seen that with you know projects in ireland and including uh, hospitals you know so you have to be very very careful when when because these corporations are so powerful and, and so uh, they're much more sophisticated than the individual governments and and they tend to give them a runaround you know and uh, and, and therefore the the, the interests of the taxpayer and 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 the the the, the families who pay tax and the business of pay tax uh, in quite a big way uh, don't t tend to be at the table. Um, but meanwhile, the corporations and a lot of these people, you know, they, they're quite sophisticated in terms of uh, in terms of using the tax system to have uh, be uh, not paying their fair share of tax, should we say. And that's not being addressed either, you know. So my concern is that we will be taxed even more. There's no one talking about, hang a second, are we paying enough taxes as individuals and uh, as families and as, as companies? I think most people, if you ask them and poll them, they'd say, we are, we're paying too much. We don't get the services we deserve for the taxes we pay you know but that's not even in the narrative you know which makes me concerned that it's sort of we're going to get more of the same you know um and that's not good the trajectory we're on for the last 20 30 40 years has, has not been not been good you know because we've had we have these massive disparities in wealth and uh, we have the environmental issues and the world's becoming less and less democratic all the time you know so you know we, we, we need to move to a more democratic world that protects the interests of individuals of families and and, and, and small to medium enterprises who, who are the backbones of all of our economies you know not not the giant corporations and it's a place for giant corporations as well i'm not against corporations you know I, you know we buy products on amazon as well and you know it can be very handy sometimes i try to buy irish as much as possible certain things you can't you can't actually buy the certain products obviously that mm. irish companies don't even make so uh, so i'm not against amazon uh, and our jeff bezos he's entitled to make a lot of money he's made a lot of money and good luck to him i respect entrepreneurs at the same time you know, when is enough is enough you know at some stage we need to say these people need to pay their fair share of taxes and uh, and then and then we, then we can create more fair and sustainable uh, uh, and equitable societies you know would it would it be fair then to kind of summarize that uh, as as being those people that have been responsible for uh, causing all of the trouble or getting us to this point in society that we're in should not be solely responsible for designing a way out of it yeah. Yeah. I and, and yeah, to a degree, to a degree. And, uh, you know, they're not all, not all corporate executives are, you know, bad people. There's lots of good people in there as well. But, but, but at the highest echelons, they have got us into this mess. And therefore the question has to be asked, are these the people who are going to get us out of this mess? And, and who, who is there at the table? representing the interests of of at the risk of repeat myself individuals families and and, and a small medium enterprise because they are they are very important in our society and i think they are not really represented at this table you know and who's, uh, and and who's responsible for of, permitting entry on into that discussion yeah 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. And because they're not really, you know, they talk about stakeholder capitalism, but this, the SME stakeholder is not at the table, uh, you know. Um, so, you know, right there, uh, you know, that that creates a, an issue there in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, the, the vested interests have more control. And a lot of it is done behind closed doors as well. That's what Davos, a lot of the, the they, they admit this themselves, that they have these closed sessions behind closed doors. So you don't really know what the real agenda is potentially, you know? Mm. So uh, yeah, that's, it has to be transparent and we have to know exactly what, what's going on and exactly what these corporations are lobbying for, what their actual outcomes are, because they have quite different uh, agendas, shall we say, than we might have. Uh, and then, and and what some of the, the academics, I mean, I, I watched a wonderful video of the Financial Times uh, talking about the Great Reset, and I had a lady, uh, Gillian, uh, Gillian Somerset Tess. Webb. Oh, oh yeah. or, no, sorry, Gillian Tett it was, yeah, who, who we've covered a few times on the blog. She's very astute and very good. And, and, and she was very positive towards it because it is positive if it's done in the right way, you know, and it's like everything. It, it, can, it can be, you know, the intention is important, is fundamental. And, uh, and, and then uh, people being able to control the outcome and not just giving up our trust and power and saying, these guys have our back and, and they're going to make it all great for us. You know, I think, I, I think uh, you, need, you need democracy there basically to inform it, you know. Yeah. The, the, I, I think I, I agree with everything you said there, Mark, absolutely. And I think it's really important, actually, one of the, the to me, the most important thing is um, once we get our priorities right in terms of what's important, a shared, shared you know, set of principles, I think they, as long as they don't tinker with incentives, um, and that's that's a political question because you know socialism is kind of an organized, centrally organized you know um, economy where you go where you're where you're told and you do what you're to, what, you, what you have to. Uh, whereas in in capitalism, it's you know you're incentivized to perform to the highest possible level and uh, to educate yourself and to to get you you know you 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 eat what you kill so to speak. And uh, and collectively, if everyone everyone's ro- you know rowing and behind and, and focusing on, on, on personal outcomes, shared outcomes become better and resource allocation is improved. Um, so if they, if they, as long as we can maintain in personal incentives um, for excellence, I think that's really important in whatever economic model comes out. Uh, and then also we have some sort of you know, shared rest- redistribution model that really, really focuses on what's important and helps people who need help and, and, uh, and does so in a fair and, and equal basis. Um, we don't have that right now. We have a lot of people in poverty traps all around the world. We have terrible problem in, in terms of food, food equity, you know, the quality of food. And, and as Mark talked about earlier about the soils, I think it's really important. Um, it's not some green, you know, tree hugging thing. It's actually, it's critical. We need to, we, you know, our environment is being devastated. The, the amount of insects in the, in the, in the air is, is down 80 percent in since the 1980s or something like that it's absolutely insane it's a it's an existential crisis that we have and there's a cliff approaching and so yeah we need to answer these questions we need a new model it needs to be more global it needs to you know uh shepherd those in, those personal incentives and uh, and i do absolutely believe we'll get out on the other side but everybody needs to get involved you need to educate yourself and and uh, and get out there and be part of the debate the risk for this moment, and I suppose we might just um, conclude with this then, Steve, the risk for this moment and, and Mark is that there are going to be some unintended consequences uh, and some risks as a result of this great reset that are going to have financial implications for our audience um, and protecting yourself by owning some gold is the way forward, correct? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, own and gold in the safest way possible, whether it be taking delivery if you feel very secure in your own home, uh, or owning it in the in the safest vaults in the world, uh, and fully allocated and fully segregated as provided by uh, our our good sales and gold core. Yeah. And the fundamental reason that it is going to protect um, those that own it going forward, Mark, is that's a historical proven store of value throughout history and during the last financial crisis and again in recent years you know we, we can all sense that we're going into financial crisis and the gold price is a barometer of risk and it's been it's been rising again in the last few years in all currencies in, the, in all currencies particularly in the last year yeah yeah and and silver as well and uh, so and a little bit of cash as well uh, you know uh, cash is important uh, for short term needs daily needs so everybody should have even we wrote about i think it's 2017 i think angela merkel's government was telling the german citizens that they should have a stockpile of food of water of candles of medicine of cash and you know people get dismissed as oh you're a crazy prepper and survivalist but you no know, in the world of today i think that the COVID and the lockdowns 
has shown that just being a little bit prepared uh, for these worst case scenarios is, is, is very, very prudent indeed. And having a few hundred euros uh, of cash uh, uh, hidden away somewhere, uh, you know, just in case ATMs don't work for two or three weeks or the credit card doesn't work or the ATM card. We're, we're all very dependent on the, the, the electronic payment system right now. And it's wonderful and, and it's great. But at the same time, yeah, having that plan B is quite important. And just as we've long said, just, you know, uh, prepare for the worst and, and hopefully it doesn't happen. If it doesn't happen, it's a bit like having the car insurance, the health insurance. You have it, you sleep better at night, you know. You don't get stressed and you don't make crazy, you know, bad decisions. I mean, you know, stress comes from having a problem, but not a plan. You know, and you need to have a plan. You need to have something to fall back on. That's what you're talking about there, which is which is exactly right. Excellent. And I suppose yeah. don't forget to add toilet roll to your list too, Mark. Okay. <laughs> gentlemen thank you very much um i'd just like to remind everybody uh to subscribe to our podcast and you can do that on itunes you can do that on youtube and on soundcloud uh, and you can consume this podcast wherever you consume podcasts if you're on youtube hit the notification bell and you'll be notified every time that we upload content podcasts and other videos as well and if you want to stay up to date with everything you can sign up for our market updates on goldcore.com but for now that has been the Goldnomics podcast, episode 16. My thanks to Stephen Flood and to Mark again, Marco Byrne once again. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and we shall see everybody soon. So stay safe. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen.